Gospel of our Lord for this Sunday comes to us from the 25th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now we're at this point where Jesus is at the end of his ministry, his time in Jerusalem. He has not yet been, you know, had the Last Supper and been betrayed yet, but he's coming up on it. And these are his last teachings. He's, he does a couple of parables talking about what the end may look like or what it to look for. And so, let's hear. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. When while they went to go buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, within this time of you know, economic troubles and uncertainties, we know the airline industry has taken a real hard hit. Um, Different companies are having to learn to pivot and try different things to, uh, to survive and change uh, in this going economy. And so uh, it recently was announced that uh, the airplane manufacturer Boeing was going to merge with a pogo stick manufacturer. The new name was going to be Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. Um, there was, um, and recently it was Jenny's birthday. And so one of the things I gave her for her birthday was a pendant with my picture in it because I wanted to show her I was independent. And then I think you probably would agree with this that um, uh, I did a pun that was so bad that I ended up in witless protection. All right, I'm going to stop before someone goes. Uh, the end of the you know the the end of the world would be better than this, brothers and sisters. Um, you know, it's one of those odd things. Once upon a time, this Sunday was known as the second Sunday before end times, before the end of the world, and then the next Sunday was you know for Sunday before the end of the world, and then end of the world. Every year, the church celebrated the end of the world, like. Easter and Ash Wednesday and Christmas, the end of the world. After all, we talk about it in, you know, the Apostles' Creed, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We know this. We remember this. I don't know why we got past it. Is it because it got hijacked and it became something much more negative and much more scary? And we, you know, somehow Jesus got turned into the ultimate boogeyman or something? I don't know. But in nowadays, this is just, I believe, the 23rd Sunday, you know, Sunday after Pentecost. In the year 2020, it's the 231st Sunday after Pentecost, it seems. But, and then what would be end of the world Sunday or end time Sunday is now known as Christ the King, which is true. It, it celebrates his reign and his coming again in glory. But what do we do? How do we respond to this, to this imagery of the bridesmaids? How do we deal with Amos and everything else like that? Is there something scary that is happening? Is there something that we need to be paying attention to? After all, Amos does say, you know, the day of the Lord is not light. It's dark. It is darkness. And it is, there, is a, there is a very definite proclamation that is being made. There is a judgment that is being issued by Amos to the people of Israel over what they were doing or what they were not doing. 
But what does this have to do with bridesmaids? Do we, what do we have to worry about? Is this something that we have to worry about? You know, is the end near? Well, you notice that I noticed that a couple of, you know, doom and gloom uh, uh, prophesiers have been, you know, kind of going, the end is near-ish. Uh, they've been wrong so many times this year that, you know, they just kind of added ish and they can keep using the sign again and again. It saved them on postage and, and, and uh, costs, office costs. So, but do we have something to worry about? Mm, well, let's stop and think about what comes to us. And that is the gift of baptism and the promises God made to us. If you repeat after me. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I've been marked with the cross of Christ forever. I am Christ's. Now, those promises are made to you, and then a challenge was made to you to let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Pay attention to that. Because Amos comes, and Amos was this farmer from Judah who went to Israel with a message. And it wasn't a friendly message. It wasn't a kind message. He came and held out a plumb line and kind of, and then me took the measure of how people were going. What was happening? The poor were being oppressed. The widow, the orphan, the stranger in the midst were being abused. They were not being treated as the law called. There was, you know, the wealthy and the powerful were having a grand time and everybody else was suffering. And Amos came and there was these people who were, you know, talking about, you know, other prophets talking about the end of the world, you know, end times, the day of the Lord is coming. Well, part of that is because the Assyrians were in the neighborhood. And there was some belief that the day of the Lord was going to come. The day of the Lord was going to come in redemption for these people to care for them. And God was going to protect them against these Assyrians. And Amos is standing there in the midst going, uh-uh. Because the day of the Lord is coming, but it's not as you think. God's not going to protect you while you do this. God is a God of the oppressed. God is a God of the one who is hurting. God is a God of the widow, the orphan, the stranger in the midst. This is the God that saved the people out of bondage and slavery in Egypt and brought them to a promised land and told them, don't turn around and oppress others. And that's what they were doing. So here's this thing, you know, it's like, I, you know, I hate your festivals. I hate your rituals. Let justice flow like a stream. In other words, do what you're supposed to be doing. Let that light, the light of the law, that light of God shine forth. Let it flow. Okay, so what does this have to do with bridesmaids? Well, think about the image of light and the lamps. Now, it's, it's interesting to note you get, you know, the five bridesmaids that are wise and five that are foolish and the five that are wise bring extra oil with them. Are they wise because they're experienced? Because this wasn't their first, you know, rodeo, so to speak. Maybe these five were the always the bridesmaid, never the bride kind of group. And they knew that sometimes things just took time and they just brought extra oil. Now, wise is a good translation for that, the word that's there. Foolish, a little bit difficult. In some cases, it almost has more of a connotation of being distracted or losing focus, being unfocused, not being awake and aware, okay? And so it's, you know, we don't have anything like that now, right? This is just a story from well, this would be about 2,500 years ago. We're not, we don't have to, we, there's nothing about anything that's distracting us, anything that's helping us lose focus, nothing that's, you know, taking our eyes off of what we're supposed to be on, right? 
there's no pandemics, there's no injustice, there's no, you know, no economic upheaval and inequalities. There's none of that kind of stuff, right? There's no, you know, COVID and no election, you know? And even without all of that stuff, let's be honest, we find ways to get distracted. We find ways to not pay attention to the widow, the orphan, the stranger in our midst, to those that are crying out for in, in, you know, crying out for justice, you know. We, you know, we have lots of. Oh, hold on. Oh, that's funny. I like that. Oh, sorry, I got distracted. We have lots of ways that we distract ourselves, that we get distracted by, and we miss out. We run out of oil. We don't pay attention. We are not able to let our light so shine before others because we just are not able or not willing. And Jesus is calling us to pay attention to just like Amos, let justice flow like streams. To pay attention and stay focused on that, to let our light so shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Guess what, folks? That's what we remember when we remember that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that we have gifts, that we are blessed to be a blessing. So that as Jesus reminded us in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the mourners, blessed are the, those that are meek, blessed are those that are persecuted, blessed are those who cry out and thirst for hunger and, you know, hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness. Wait a minute, these people are blessed? No. The world will not bless them. God wants them blessed. We're blessed to be a blessing. Sealed by the Holy Spirit, we are gifted to be able to do different things. Right now, we got a blood drive going on. All the work going on with the lot at 22nd Street, and we're going to be helping them out with Thanksgiving. The different give and greets and all of the different agencies and lives that we touch. The kindness rocks. On, on Monday night and all the kinds, I've had people, kind, different people tell me stories about what a difference even one of those has made in their lives. Or the, the fact that then families have been able to make them as an activity for them to do and then to go and share with their neighbors. You know, a, a kindness rock? Yes. You can let that light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You can keep that lamp lit. There's lots of ways in which we do it. In our own different ways, in the different ways in which we are called, we are blessed to be a blessing because we're called to do this. We are marked with the cross of Christ forever. It is our sign, it is our symbol. It is our reminder that we are a part of that which will go on forever, that it cannot be killed because it'll just rise again. But we are also called to be a part of that which literally flowed down the mountain, the justice of God's justice in the face of our injustice on Mount Calvary, as Jesus bled out. It is this gift that we have, but it is a calling that we have to let that light so shine before us. This gift that has been given to us, we are called to be a part of this, to bless the poor, to bless the meek, to bless those who mourn, to bless those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to bless those who are persecuted, to let that light shine and not be involved with the dark. When the dark is there, we are called to let that light shine, to stand up, to advocate, to encourage, to support, to show compassion, to reach out, to use our generosity of our time, our talent, our treasures, whatever it is, because it's there. Now, some of you might be going, all right, you said, Pastor, that we really don't have to worry about the end times. But I don't know if I've done it or I've done enough. You know, have I been distracted and missed out on times when I should do something? Or I didn't do things or I didn't do it enough. 
why should I not have to worry? Why should I not have to think of the fact that I might be one of those knocking on the door and the Lord saying, truly, I don't know you. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever. You are Christ's. There is no door or wall anymore because the one that came for us is the one who got rid of the door and the wall forever. The boundary that separated life from death, he even conquered so that we too might live a new life. We too can rise again. We too see that light and in that light, we let that light shine. That light of hope and peace, that light of love and justice and righteousness and mercy and all of those gifts that we receive, that is, the barrier is gone. We don't need to worry about that. We've been set free. And now we're just called to not worry about those things, but let that light shine. In a world that seems to want to tear each other apart, when we want to ignore our neighbor and, or, even, or hate our neighbor as opposed to love our neighbor, in all of the ways in which we might ignore like the people of Israel did, Ignore, demean, belittle, or whatever, the widow, the orphan, the stranger in our midst. All of those people we are called to love because they too are our neighbors. That's what we need to worry about. Not whether or not we're going to get in or whether or not Jesus is going to know us. Jesus already knows us because he's claimed us. So we can focus. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Light that light. Share that light. Show that light. That light that came to us, claimed, sealed, marked, that we are out of the love of God in Jesus Christ. Lift high that light to the world. And remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.